Hi class, it's time now to talk about the sociology of influencing and conforming. First of all, we need to define and understand what conformity is. So what really is conformity? We all have ideas of what it is, but if you think about the definition of it, it really refers to a type of social influence involving change in belief or behavior in order to fit in with a group. If you're living in isolation, there's nothing to conform to. So that social influence element is critical. Social influence, in fact, creates conformity. And in a lot of ways, it's positive and good. Imagine if we didn't know how to behave in certain settings, how awkward and uncomfortable it would be and how misunderstandings could occur like waiting in line when you're at, a, at um, a fast food restaurant to get food or any service area. If you didn't know to wait a line, you walked right in front, you could create a lot of problems for yourself. So conformity can be a good thing to know. It teaches us societal norms. There are different times of conformity. There's imitation conformity, and this is really something that occurs more unconsciously. I've lived all throughout the United States, and when I lived in the South, I actually picked up more of a Southern accent. When I lived in Minnesota, I had more of that Canadian, it's a boat time accident. I'm sort of exaggerating it now. I don't live there anymore. But we tend to mimic those around us a bit, either their mannerisms or their accents. That's imitation conformity. A lot of times people will think that children who are adopted are actually not adopted because they see similar mannerisms. That really is a reflection of imitation conformity. And we don't really realize we're doing it. In terms of informational conformity, this is where we're seeking accuracy or correctness. So we're seeking information so that we can do the right thing or the accurate thing in that particular context or setting. So a lot of times once we learn where to recycle, we're looking for the blue bins or whatever bins they are, we then conform to that behavior. Typically there's a value that we already have or that we develop and we're just trying to do the right thing, but we need the right kind of information. If you go to another country and blue bins aren't the color, but they're green or gray, you'd need that information in order to conform appropriately. But usually with informational conformity, we're seeking it out or it's been shared with us and we buy into it. Normative conformity is sort of in between imitational and informational. With normative conformity, we do things um, to be liked or accepted. Um, it's not so much standing in line. It is really what you see with cliques, maybe when you were in high school or middle school or even younger, or even at the workplace when you start to notice ways in which people behave. I will say that I've worked at organizations where the expectation is we respond to emails within the day that we receive them, which can mean I'm working until nine o'clock at night. And other settings where the expectation is email is more like snail mail and you respond to them within a week or so and that we text or chat each other in another way if something is immediate. So to be liked or accepted, we will look for ways to engage in normative conformity based on the norms in that context or place. Now, there's an, a topic that you've learned about so far this week, if you've already done your readings, which is majority influence. And really what this focuses on the fact that if several people in a space, in a room, um, in the setting that you're in, are conforming to something, we are much more likely to also conform, even as, if it if it isn't what would have come naturally to us, or even if we don't necessarily agree, especially if we're unsure. And the more consistent those folks are, the more likely we are to conform. But minor minority influence can happen. When someone is knowledgeable and is, has power and authority, a minority decision or behavior or action can impact and change the group, but it all depends on how the people in the room or the space perceive that person in the minority. So let's talk about circumstances because they can impact the likelihood that will conform. And in this case, size matters. The size of the majority group affects conformity. If there's three of you and two are really interested in engaging a behavior like riding a roller coaster and one is not, then you are less likely to be persuaded by the roller coaster riders. I can share a story with you. Back when I was in graduate school, I went to a conference in New Orleans with four of my friends, and they were all talking about getting tattoos, and I had absolutely no interest. This was about 
20 years ago. So getting a tattoo was not as common as it is today. The whole flight there, they talked about which kind of tattoo they would get, where they wanted to get it. Maybe we should do it in New Orleans. And I was sort of that minority person who didn't want to do it. But the four of them were convinced. They thought it was a great idea. So I started thinking about it, thinking maybe it would be nice. I thought about where I would place it so that I could feel comfortable. And I thought about what I might do. And I really wanted to design something of my own so that I didn't have a tattoo like everyone else's. So the group started to influence me. Now, the mistake that I made when we were there is once they had convinced me, this majority group, four to one, I went first. I won't tell you how many of us got on the plane with tattoos after that experience, but I wasn't happy. The unanimity of the majority also matters. In this case, again, everyone had the same position who was in the majority. We've got to get a tattoo. We've got to get a tattoo. There can be other things as well. If everyone unanimously believes something, as we see with the ASH experiment, and you'll read more and watch a video on this as well, we're much more likely to go along with it if they're giving the same answer. If you have a minority view, but others have varying views that lean with the majority, you're less likely to change your mind. But when they all feel exactly the same way, yes, we should get a tattoo, it is much more persuasive. That certainly was my experience. Now, the importance of the task or the topic also matters. We don't mind not conforming if the task is less consequential. I gave you the example of the roller coaster. My husband likes some, he doesn't like a lot of the others. Everyone else in the family loves them. It's not that important. He's not going to lose family members. He's not going to lose a job. He does not have to ride a roller coaster. He has no problem saying, no thanks, you guys go have fun. It's really not that important. But when you think of a jury and that they have to be, they have to unanimously decide, if a case is difficult to decide upon, it can take days and weeks for a jury to agree because the weight or the importance of it is critical. And so it's not so easy for that minority perspective to change their mind. And the amount of time it takes some juries to do that, my family and I could have ridden 20 roller coasters and my husband happily had several margaritas, hot dogs, or ice cream while we're on those rides. Not a big deal, right? And then there are some conformity studies that are really critical for you to note. Milgram's obedience study, Google it, take a look at the videos that I've shared in my class. Essentially what Milgram was looking to prove was that the individualistic and strong nature of United States Americans um, lent themselves less, less likely to do what soldiers in the Nazi regime in World War II did, which is conform to authority even when they disagreed and knew something was wrong, like torturing and killing thousands, millions of Jews and others. He believed that Americans would be least likely to do that. Sadly, what he learned through the study is there's certain elements of power and certain impacts of conformity that all humans, or I shouldn't say all, most humans succumb to, which is really important in understanding the profound impact that our social circumstances can have on the likelihood that we will conform. Make sure you watch our videos, read the articles, and certainly Google more about that. Milgram's obedience studies tell us a lot about humanity and things that I know I try to keep in mind and prevent in myself when something is important and high stakes, even if I, it might cost me something. Also, the ASH and the majority influence study is one that you've learned about or will learn about already. And essentially what it shows that when the majority of the people in the room say something that is even obviously not true, the one minority person will go along with it. What's happening there? Sometimes they want to be accepted. Other times they're thinking, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe that line is the longest of all of the other lines. So make sure you spend some time looking at that. But Ash's study really shows that the majority of the people have to give the exact same answer in order to persuade a minority opinion that's actually the correct one to vote or respond in the same direction as the majority, even when it's incorrect. Now let's talk about the role of power in conformity, which is a critical, critical piece of Milgram's work. So what's power? In lay terms, it's the extent to which you have or make happen whatever you want. The more powerful you are, the greater ability you have to make whatever you want to happen, happen. So social power is the ability of a person to create conformity 
even when the people being influenced may attempt to resist those changes. So powers making something happen no matter what, that can happen in a social or individual context. You could be living out in the middle of the woods in Alaska, and you may have the power because of your physical force and your mental knowledge and agility to chop trees, build a cabin, fashion um, tools to make fire and to hunt, and you may have the power to live. So that's one form of power. But really what we're talking about in social psychology is this concept of social power or having the ability to cre create conformity among people around you, even when the people being influenced may attempt to resist those changes. There are five types of this social power. The reward type in which people receive positive or negative rewards. Obviously the positive rewards will lead you to do more of what the person in power says, or they might promise you negative consequences if you don't do it. Reward type of power is commonly used in the workplace and also in families and with parents raising small children. Coercive really focuses on actual punishment. So again, it could happen in the workplace. It may really happen within families. It can happen in other contexts as well. We won't fund your program unless you move in this direction, vote in this direction, etc. So there are severe punishments of harm if you don't do what the powerful are requesting that you do. And if they have the ability to utilize those punishments to get you to do what they want, then they possess coercive power. Legitimate power is the type of power that most of us accept, which is someone has the authority to de demand conformity. During my day job, I'm a vice president of instruction at a college, and I have the right to expect certain things of the deans that work for me and for them to expect certain things of the staff and faculty who work for them. If they don't, I'm going to get in trouble and they're going to get in trouble, but it's an illegitimate type of power. And the certain things that I have power over are listed in my job descriptions. It's not everything, but things that fall within curriculum and instruction. So we recognize legitimate power as people working in roles, and therefore they have the right to influence and expect conformity in the areas that they oversee. Referent power is when you identify with the power holder. We see this very much in um, influencer, influencers, and that's why different types of influencers are going to be popular. So those who you identify with or who you would like to identify with are likely to have referent power. You can refer to or relate to them. It's their relatability. You feel like you're more like them or you want to be like them, so you're more likely to do things that they say. An athlete influencer is more likely to be influencing among other athletes. I think you get the point. Someone that is similar to you in the influencing role, you're more likely to follow than someone who is not. And finally, expert power. When we believe that someone's an expert, then that power holder's expertise is what leads us to follow in their stead. Certainly when um, Fauci was considered the expert in um, communicable health and disease, the expectation was we would follow what he suggested during COVID. Now, many questioned that, but the primary reason that we followed it is he was an expert in communicable diseases. There's also a difference in conformity when it comes to a person's identity, in particular gender identity or culture. Women are more likely to conform because they're socialized to care about the feelings of others' desires or to show that they care about the feelings of others' desires. It is a gender expectation. So you will find that they're more likely to conform than men are if the perceptions of others are, play a factor. Men are also more likely not to conform if they can show their authority of, or power through nonconformance. Boys and men are socialized to be leaders, to be independent, and to be assertive and sometimes even aggressive. So they are more likely not to conform, again, not if a vast majority is conforming, but they're more likely not to conform in situations where it's iffy, if it can establish them as meeting their male gendered normative behaviors. We've learned a lot about culture, to collectivist and individualistic societies. Members of collectivist societies are far more likely to conform, especially within 
institutions and settings within their society because it's all about the group and not the individual, whereas more individualistic societies like the United States, in fact, rated the most individualistic, we are more likely to see people not willing to conform. We talked last week about power distance index. Those who have a high power distance index or believe more in the hierarchies within um, societies and within cultures are more likely to conform as long as someone has those positions of power with established within that society. Those who are lower on power distance are more likely not to conform even when someone has a legitimate role or authority. Masculine versus feminine cultures, and again, this isn't really about being male or female. It's just about having more of those masculine qualities, being um, leaders, being expected to be leaders, innovative, and exert power versus social and complacent. Depending on what type of culture one comes from, they're more or less likely to conform, and their role within that culture can be impacted. So it's important that you understand conformity in you and your life now that you've learned a bit about conforming. conformity. Use what you know to understand yourself and others in different situations. What's going on? Why do you feel the need to conform? Think about these elements that we've talked about. Or when you see someone else conforming and you're surprised, try to gather what's going on and maybe you can change the situation. Conformity, power, and how we lead matters. Use your new knowledge for good, or you can use it not for good, but please use it for good. And remember, culture and gender play a role in all of these conformity situations. Thank you.